From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 224, recorded on December 1st, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon Despommiers. Hello, Vincent and everybody else. Um, it's too dark outside now to say what the weather is like, but today has been real snotty, uh, low temperatures, a uh, little drizzle here, a little drizzle there. Not the kind of day you want to spend outside. And uh, thank goodness uh, I didn't have to. So uh, still raining. Great it's raining in five degrees here. Celsius here in New York. Yeah. yeah. We have yeah. A, so this is our second we're going to do two twips a month. We're going to have one where we do our clinical cases and then a second twip where we have a guest or we do some other papers. And today we have a guest for you. Uh, he was last on twip number 30, which was 12 years ago. Long time. Time passes. <laughs> Chuck Kanersh, welcome back. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here with you, Vincent and Dixon, and I look forward to today's discussion. So, uh, Chuck, tell us what what were you doing? Cause back then you were doing something else and you're not doing that anymore. So what are you doing these yeah. days? Yeah. You know, I actually, before this call, I, uh, tried to remember what we talked about 12 years ago <laughs> and it was interesting. Um, you know, I came in to talk about public private partnerships and some of the work I've been doing, uh, at Pfizer with the international trachoma initiative, but the conversation, we, we talked about polio. We talked about SARS one, how it came and went, um, and I talked a little bit about a, a, a drug that we had actually synthesized for SARS and we're studying for mm. cold viruses, other coronaviruses that was repurposed for polio, um, with the task force for global health down in Atlanta. So isn't it ironic that we yeah. actually had a full blown follow on to SARS, which, you know, kept us pretty busy for the last four years. And, uh, I left Pfizer earlier this year around the time of the billionth dose of uh, azithromycin for trachoma and focusing on writing the eighth edition of the parasitic diseases textbook with Dixon. And um, mm -hmm. we've gotten through a number of chapters that maybe will be some of the subject of the neglected tropical diseases update that we do today. Were you uh, involved with SARS-CoV-2 at all when you were at Pfizer? Yes, because, you know, we, we were slightly busy. With <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get a lot of those questions today, Chuck, so just get used to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we know it was incredible. And, you know, when you, when you think of the vaccine going from start of pandemic to emergency authorization in under a year, mm. well, the same thing was done with an antiviral. Right. And, and I can tell you, up until that point, the fastest we had gone anywhere in the industry, but at, at Pfizer, was for our HIV CCR5 inhibitor. And that was from idea to a medicine in seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. We were in a, a, a phase three trial of a C. diff vaccine that at that point had taken us about eight uh, years to get to. And we had enrolled 16,000 or so patients in a phase three trial. Here comes a pandemic, and you know, I, I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that happen. Good science, a little bit of luck, you know, how immunodominant uh, I think the spike protein was. Yeah. Um, who, who would have thought that mRNA, you know, that we've been working on for 20 years, out of the box, you know, in a trial that was powered for 60 per percent uh, efficacy, comes out in the high 80s, 90 percent. I mean, boy, and um, I'm sure glad, um, you know, I was able to get vaccinated because I. Uh, it was ironic that as a Pfizer employee, I was doing some volunteer work in White Plains at the public health clinic. So I wanted a vaccine. You know, I'm a, I'm at a slightly high risk age group. Um, so I went to White Plains Hospital and uh, not White Plains, uh, Valhalla, uh, the county mm -hmm. hospital where they were giving out uh, and I got the Moderna vaccine of the irony of all our ironies. <laughs> um, so, but I just wanted something because I wanted to be protected. Yeah. Well, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when Daniel and I started the uh, the, the clinical updates, uh, you joined us for uh, some time. I remember that. Do you remember those yeah. sessions? 
You know, those were incredibly scary times, right? Mm -hmm. We were trying to repurpose just about every molecule under the sun. We wanted hydroxychloroquine to work. We wanted ivermectin to work. We talked a little bit about it in the show, but we knew that the evidence in the science had to be done rigorously before yeah. people would just go on those medicines. But, you know, I mean, just a visual I have still is, you know, my wife and I needed to drop something off um, to a friend at Columbia Presbyterian. Um, I, I was sort of providing some scientific support to some of the new studies. And we literally drove around Manhattan, stopped at Central Park to see the 10 cities there, saw the, you know, the container ship that was in the Hudson River. But we did that whole trip from where I live in Westchester County in about an hour and a half. I mean, it would take an hour and a half for me just to drive to where Dixon is right now in Fort Lee, right? I mean, it just shows you that people were in their houses, in yeah, their yeah. caves. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, we moved on. We, you know, also the antiviral that Pfizer, um, you know, uh, de developed. I think in the last show, I talked about how in La Jolla, our medicinal chemists had synthesized something like 60 plus compounds for SARS-1. Yeah. Um, the SARS one, I guess that was a pandemic extincted itself. Um, maybe less transmissible, high mortality, wasn't able to, you know, didn't have these high viral shedders and relatively asymptomatic people. Um, so these, these compounds are sitting there on the shelf, right? They, they hadn't gone through the whole, mm. you know, uh, you find a molecule, you do a whole bunch of combinatorial chemistry, synthesize thousands of compounds, but i really, small group of really talented people at Pfizer um, took some of those molecules off the shelf. There were some pharmacological properties that were not ideal. They were insoluble, um, did some more chemistry and, you know, uh, went with, you know, what later became uh, uh, Paxlova, which, you know, is boosted with ritonavir because of, you know, just enhanced its pharmacokinetic properties. So I think, all three of us have been on Paxlovid yeah, at one yeah. time. I know Dixon and I have. I, I have, yeah. Might have, yeah. And when it you came, know, and it's, yeah. I was on it twice. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I ran out to the pharmacy in Seattle at the Tropical Medicine. No, together I remember for you. that. And yeah. Vincent came down with it just after he got home. So, From that um, HDMH in Seattle, yeah. But yeah. I, I, the next day after I started, my symptoms were almost gone. It was great. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, it's still a very good antiviral despite some others being out there, it's really uh, excellent. So, I, I think it also shows you um, when you, I mean, I, I understand why we go through the stage gates of decision making. We look at the data, we look at the data, and we have this, we have too many entities to put through a pipeline to get to phase three. But, you know, the regulators really rolled up their sleeves. The academics did heroic work with um, enrolling patients in, 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 in clinical trials. And so I think we know that what we used to do, sort of the standards before the pandemic are no longer the standards. And we can, if we do things right, you know, let's talk about some cancers. We need to really have much more improved therapy for some of the inflammatory diseases. How about a new antibiotic for some of the resistant pathogens that we, we with good science and really sort of everybody working at this together, we can, we can do things faster. I, I do believe that firmly now. We, we've shown that. Well, today I wanted to talk about the um, WHO roadmap for neglected tropical diseases. And I think you uh, are quite familiar with this. So wh why, don't you, why don't you tell us what is that and how did it come about? Yeah, so I think this is just a phenomenal work effort um, led by the World Health Organization. Um, but it also, in, in my mind, because we did talk about the first version of this, um, uh, you know, as part of the Millennial Development Goals um, when we spoke uh, 12 years ago. So this is, a, this is now the second roadmap. Um, and it, it really shows WHO's evolution as an organization, I believe, um, and the way we need to approach the NTDs is not just this siloed organization sitting with its headquarters in Geneva, not particularly well connected to the regions, you know, WHO, Afro, which is the African region, whatnot, and how integrated um, this document shows how integrated WHO is with the regions um, and with the NGOs and the stakeholders, with the ministries of health, with the treating um, uh, uh, 
practitioners, with the public health people. So I, I think it's a phenomenal document. And, and what it really does also is it it relies on and it gives account when well, it doesn't give accountability it expects accountability from the countries themselves hmm. because when we're talking about neglected tropical diseases they affect a billion people or so right uh these are people in low-income countries although our good friend peter hotez has written a book talking about how many of these de- diseases can spill over into high-income countries you know the blue barbel uh, health book he's written um, but really, the burden of disease is in low-income countries, so they really have to take this on. The countries we're talking about are likely to have all, and there's now 20 now that we'll talk about, they're likely to have all 20 of these, these diseases, um, and these are last-mile diseases. At the end of the road, past anything that's paved, it's a dirt road, um, uh, and you know, very difficult um, to access health services. So... I, I think the document um, takes stock of where we are. So the first roadmap was looking at elimination of many of these diseases by the year 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, you know, some diseases, pretty good work, but many of these diseases, it, it's time to rethink what's going on, potentially look at um, different modalities, you know, maybe relying less on, in some cases, and we can talk a bit about schistosomiasis, Prosequantil has been available. The Schisto Control Initiative at Imperial College has done a wonderful job um, sort of organizing and advocacy and getting this out into the hands of communities. But there are communi- communities where uh, you just see short-term reductions mm-hmm. in the measures of schistosomiasis, and we're not really getting to the elimination uh, uh, targets of 2020, not even close to them. Other diseases were doing much better. So, um, so, so I mean, they, the, the, they, go ahead. they a, use the yeah. word elimination, right? They don't, mm-hmm. what's the difference between that and eradication? So uh, elimination can be defined in a number of different ways. Part, so, sometimes it, uh, you can talk about it at a country level. So there's global bird disease, but let's say the Gambia eliminates trachoma, which they have done. Mm-hmm. And they go through a, a formal certification problem. I think when we talk about uh, a disease and a virus like smallpox, even that we should be careful about not saying eradication because it exists in two laboratories, right? One in Atlanta and I think one in Moscow. Mm-hmm. Um, so eradication would mean it's gone. It's, it, but in my mind, it's in, you know, I'm sure, Vincent, since you did the first CDNA clone copy, in my <laughs> mind, if you know a sequence of something, yeah. is it ever really eradicated, right? No. No, it's not. That's right. It's very easy That's to get right. back. I mean, yeah. I think so, that you uh, are right because the, the problem with polio eradication is that we can never eradicate it because it's in wastewater and circulates silently. So the the idea of eradication was was done before we understood this, and now it really needs to be called the elimination. So. Yeah. so, Chuck, wouldn't wouldn't you agree that you could probably divide all of the infectious diseases that – fall into the category of neglected tropical diseases into two categories. One is that it's dependent upon sanitation. And the other is not. So some are vector-borne. Some are require exotic uh, intermediate hosts, like a snail, for instance, which looks like a weak spot in the life cycle, but it doesn't turn out to be that way. And then you've got these diseases that you can't eliminate no matter what because the sanitation doesn't exist. Mm. And if you don't attack that first, then <clears throat> none of these other things are possible. So what does the new roadmap look like with regards to sanitation? So, so before I answer that, Dick, so maybe I should just do a backtrack a little bit on, on some of the histories of what are we calling neglected tropical diseases? Yeah, um, that's a yeah. great idea. That's yeah. a great idea. Because, I, you know, there were eight when we last spoke. Um, and our friend Peter Hotez, David Molyneux, Alan Fennec really put this together. And it was a time when uh, the Global Fund was taking care of the big three, right? AIDS, TB, and malaria. They were funding all the medicines for whoever you could put a program together to make those available for those three diseases. Um, PEPFAR also came in and actually really took HIV programming to scale. Um, and what, what, 
the three of those, what, what Peter, David, and Alan did was lump together eight of, of the diseases that we'll talk a little bit about, things like schisto, lymphatic filariasis, slash mania, um, and to show that these chronic diseases that don't kill you as quickly as, say, malaria does, but combined um, have a burden of disease in terms of the, the disease-adjusted life years. And we talked a little bit about that last time. Um, uh, and deserved the focus. They also showed, um, actually, that in terms of programming for public health and you know looking for funders, it was one of the best public health um, buys you could make. Um, and they made a video. They did some wonderful advocacy about it. Um, you know, today now I was looking at the the roadmap, just preparing a little bit for this discussion. Um, and we now have, I think, five bacterial, two viral. So we have both rabies and dengue being included in the neglected tropical diseases, and then thirteen helminth slash protozoal diseases. Um, so you know, back to your your question, Dixon. I, I, I think that wash or the sanitation water, you know, sanitation is a part of every disease elimination program. Um, the one I worked on for 25 years, trachoma, a bacterial disease that has chlamydia in the eyes. Um, an essential part of that strategy is teaching kids about washing their eyes in the morning. Um, um, and not just the, the mass, you know, drug treatment, um, with an abonic, excuse me for one second. I have a, one of the disadvantages of working at home. I have a 13 year old dog that gets lonely when I close the door and try yeah. to work. So yeah. he's been hopefully not picking up uh, his uh, whining outside the door. He's not with me. Um, so, but anyway, um, so I think that the, the issue around schistosomiasis, because Dixon is the chapter we just uh, worked on together, you know, the last vaccine, it was a phase three trial, um, failed. And, you know, we could talk a little bit maybe at another time about a multicellular helminth. I wonder how well we can make a vaccine for that. Potentially the infectious form, the sacral form, I, you know, I, I think maybe that, that that's possible, but maybe for another discussion. So I think it is going to come down to sanitation. When you look at guinea worm or dracunculosis, I mean, the, there is no therapeutic for that. That's it's the right. treatment when you have it is to roll it on a stick, right? I mean, yeah, primitive exactly. is that. But exactly. the public health measure was to keep humans that were infected away from water sources. Also, the copepods with you know the, the netting over filtered water. And with heroic work by the Carter Center. Uh, and Jimmy Carter wants, wanted to, you know, to see the last case of guinea worm declared um, gone. Um, and we're close to that one. Unfortunately, now we realize that there are, are other, other mammals, hosts. other hosts, That's which right. was Dogs. only recently recognized, That's right. um, which is, by the way, when you look at the NTD roadmap, um, which they divide into multiple different sectors with uh, sections with, um, indicators for declaring that you're getting, making progress and getting towards elimination goals, but also specific targets for clean water, et cetera, whatever is relevant to the disease. So clean water, you know, it, it happens though that, you know, when you, when you work with the, the water non-governmental organizations, the most expensive part of public health is bringing clean water That's right. to places. You know, and I think that that's, you know, Dixon, you know, kudos to you on your new book, uh, you know, The New City. I mean, you, you spend quite a bit of time in that book thinking about even urban areas and how rainwater can be captured and used efficiently. And, you know, some of those the, those measures, sorry to make a plug for the book, but it is a, a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful book, Dixon. Congratulations Thank on you. that. Thank you. Um, because Scott Halstead, uh, as you know, um, was a former president of the ASTMNH, the American Society for Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and his presidential speech was entitled dot, 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 and hygiene, because that's the last name of the organization. And uh, almost no one talked about it before he did because they knew it was an intractable situation in most cases. So vaccines 
if we had a vaccine for every parasite that are now classified as a neglected tropical disease, so that we don't have to have clean water anymore in order to get rid of these things, we can just give a vaccine and it's gone. What if you could just wave a magic wand for a moment? How many other diseases do you think <laughs> are transmitted by waterborne um, mechanisms that don't fall under the category of NTDs that will still be there no matter what? I mean, that's the frustrating part of this, is that no matter how many flies you swat with your swatter, there'll be 200 more flies to replace each one of those flies. And it's a sanitation problem. It's a basic. That's why we don't have these things in this country. I mean, I've got, unfortunately, I've got a lot of this uh, plastic. Forget the plastic. That's clean water. Uh, that's exactly what's missing when we travel. What do we worry about first? Where our drink of water comes from, where our food comes from, and maybe if there are mosquito nettings over the beds. But I think absolutely whatever goes in to your system, that's how these organisms have evolved to uh, gain entrance into us. And we're, we're still struggling with that concept, I'm afraid. Chuck, what are, what are the uh, – tell, tell us the some of the organisms that are on this roadmap tell, and tell us a bit about Sure. Them. I mean, I'll just start. Um, they actually have um, – and we can put up the uh, the link for the the roadmap for people so that when I reference, there's the executive summary or the overview, which is about six pages. And in the last page, they have the organisms and they have a table that um, talks about those that are targeted. And they use the word eradication. And they have two, which are draconculiasis yep. and yaws. So yaw, yaws is a, um, a trepanine very similar to the organism that causes syphilis. Actually, in the founding charter of the World Health Organization, um, uh, law, YAWS um, elimination or eradication was listed as one of the, and India went out using benzathine penicillin, mm. which requires an injection, and actually was the first country with a de design program uh, to use mass drug administration um, in, in a targeted manner in, in areas that were high risk for, for yaws to eliminate the disease. Another grouping is um, those diseases which uh, transmission is, is, is being, mm -hmm. and, and I think the prototype for that is onchocerciasis, right? And the whole river blindness program um, and the work that Merck did um, through the mechanism do donation program uh, to give ivermectin for uh, forever, basically. I mean, Randy, uh, uh, Roy Vagilis, sorry, Randy, I trained with Randy Vagilis, Roy Vagilis, his son at Columbia, um, and said Merck will provide this drug forever. Um, and that's good because, actually, you can't eliminate the adult worms in humans. And so after a round of, of, of treatment, they become, uh, over after a period of time, infectious again. For the, for the black flies that then, uh, you know, transmit the disease. So um, the next grouping are eliminated as public health programs. This includes um, Chagas, human African trypanosomes, which are getting really close to actually. Uh, uh, these are going away. Lish, Leishmania, still a huge problem. Lymphatic filariasis, still a huge pro problem. Rabies, perennial problem. Schistosomiasis. Soil transmitted helminthiasis. So these are the, the, the worms that knock children, Ascaris, Trichuris, um, uh, hookworms, that knock kids off their, their growth curves. Trachoma is listed in that. And then those that are targeted for control, um, and these are things like scabies, snake bite, and, and venoming, um, some of the, the tapeworms. Um, cutaneous leishmania, leishmania, and then some of the foodborne treatment tones. So it's a pretty extensive list. And, you know, frankly, if you're one of these countries with per capita incomes, you know, that put you in the World Bank classification as lower income countries, um, you, you know, it must seem like a formidable task. Um, obviously, some prioritization has to be done. Um, most of these countries, by the way, have the big three diseases, malaria, TB, 
uh, and HIV. So these are uh, really formidable, you know, health problems. And I think the beauty of the Global NT Roadmap is that it takes these problems and, and works them into developing and what are called this movement towards sustainable health systems. And so you can look at the NTDs that involve the skin. Mm -hmm. You can work with primary care providers, the front lines that are, are dealing you know, with skin based um, illnesses and backtrack to the NTDs and have really practical um, interventions. A lot of it is what Dixon referenced already, clean water. So when, with trachoma, cleaning your eyes. Um, when you have lymphatic filariasis, or, or, or the colloquial term for it, elephantiasis, part of the treatment is not just knocking down the filaria, but it's taking good care of the, the legs, the limbs that have been now, their lymphatic circulation has been disrupted, they get bacterial and fungal super infections. So it's, it's good. It's not really wound care, but it's good clean, cleansing care of these limbs that no longer have their lymphatic drainage to prevent the bacterial and super infection, which causes, you know, quite a bit of the morbidity as well. I don't know. Let me stop there. Dixon thoughts on, on that, that, that riff or. Oh, well, I, I, what I would love to hear from you is if you were in charge of any of these, uh, what would your team look like and how would you engage the countries that are suffering the most? How would you triage, let's say in Africa, the, the countries that have some versus the countries that have total transmission year round? How do you go about uh, getting the people to cooperate? Because cooperation is a big problem too. Matter of fact, with regards to the ivermectin program, there are three countries in West Africa that have never participated mm. in the ivermectin program. And they're suspicious of Westerners coming in and telling them what to do. And for that reason, they would have nothing to do with it. And so you know, they represent a reservoir for this infection that will always be there, unfortunately, unless something political happens that allows them to go ahead and get on board. They can clearly see the results in the other countries so they're not unaware of the fact that what they're doing is really preventing their citizens from living healthier lives, but it's really a shame. So if you're an officer at, let's say, WHO, and you're in charge of, let's say, schistosomiasis, which is one of our better-known infections, what does your team below that look like until finally it percolates down into the country itself? Yeah, so I don't think I need to say anything innovative or novel because it, it, you know, the roadmap tells us what we need to do really for just okay. So and, that's, that's basically what I was asking you for. Oh yeah. And so let me just speak a little bit about that because I think when I'm, I'm looking at, um, now a page for the, the, the targets, um, milestones and the indicators, um, uh, in, in this overview executive summary. And I'll just go to the multi-sectoral coordination piece and, it, it wants 100%, and, and what it says, access to at least basic water supply, sanitation, and hygiene in areas endemic for neglected tropical diseases. By the way, this maps to the Sustainable Development Goal 6, which is um, all about, you know, this. So I think this, there's, a, there's the, the top-down piece, yes, the UN and WHO set normative guidelines for these types of things. But then to, you know, get at what you were talking about, so the country that might be suspicious about this top-down approach, you know, the types of solutions for that are running train-the-trainer type of meetings. And so local, the, the country next door that they maybe, you know, have a, a good relationship with, and, you know, that's a tricky thing with, you know, conflict in, in many parts of the world. Uh, bringing some of those people in to have a discussion about the problem, you know, how they addressed it successfully. So you're taking successful examples that are more from the region, from the local areas. Um, and, you know, the how-to is coming from that local knowledge and that mm. local uh, um, uh, uh, community. The other thing is, is that instead of having a trachoma program, a lymphatic filariasis program, a, you know, where, where there are, diseases that have overlap. And in, in one of the papers that 
you know, came out from, you know, Peter Hortez, Molyneux, and, and Fennec was showing this heat map with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven overlapping diseases um, in areas. And so integrated work on things like surveillance. So let's, let's go in and, you know, there's a multiplex diagnostic an ELISA or something like that um, that can be used. Um, let's work that up. Um, if there's not, then we could use case surveillance reporting. Also, when you're coming in with multiple drugs to treat the various NTDs, and by the way, your malaria that's coming with the rainy season, um, how about safety reporting and having a, a one form that can be filed uh, to the local regulatory organizations or, or something that's coordinated by an NGO like the Task Force for Global Health or WHO? Um, to make it easy to report side effects from the, the, the various programs, because we, we need to know about those things. So a lot of this is about integration, you know, the top-down stuff from the funders that, you know, will, will address the really intractable problems like clean water, but the grassroots work to have the people at the front lines um, uh, able to be mentored by people that have been involved with successful programs in an adjacent geography. So, uh, Chuck, and I noticed that. <clears throat> Sorry, go. You, go no, ahead. you first. I just wanted to know the the roadmap has targets for these different uh, diseases, and so what is how does it work? So, if you have a, if you're a country with, um, say, uh, leishmaniasis, they say reduction, you know. From fifty thousand to fewer than five thousand, do they provide some guidance on how you're going to do that? So the, let me let me talk about a disease I know more about than leishmaniasis. Sure, sure. I mean, I know about leishmaniasis from an academic thing, but I I, I have more firsthand experience with with sure. trachoma, for instance. Um, so there's a whole process. So the WHO recommends that um, in at a certain threshold, when you go and flip an eyelid and you see follicles. Um, that are likely to represent uh, trachoma, if that's over 10%, then, then that region at a district level, and that's an administrative zone within uh, countries that roll up to the Ministry of Health, that whole district should receive um, antibiotic uh, treatment annually for three years, and then a, a follow-up survey is done after that. When the survey um, uh, reaches the elimination goals, again, set by um, uh, WHO, and this is obviously convened with scientists and experts in the, in the field and local representation, um, they can go through a process to get certified for elimination. Mm. It, it sounds bureaucratic, not, not the field work and the administration of the drug, but when a country uh, certifies elimination, you can, there's a bit of competitiveness that you want to see in the field, right? I mean, mm. a minister of health from the Gambia that uh, can certify elimination and talk about this proudly of the work they've done, that has a knock-on effect to uh, a, a, an adjacent country maybe that isn't um, a, as far along in the program. Maybe those people, again, are those train the trainers that you then take to the adjacent uh, 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 country um, to help work in those pro programs. So I, I think that that's you know, you know, one example I, I don't know what the answer for Shisto is going to be. And I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this and talking to Dixon about this. And, um, you know, I give a lecture to the, the postgraduate uh, seminar at, at the London School of Hygiene every year about integration of trachoma into some of the other um, yeah. uh, with um, onchocerciasis and lymphatic filariasis and how that stepwise program was developed. Uh, I think we're at a real risk right now with Shisto, still with one drug. And we know that resistance to praziquantel, it's a wonderful drug, but we know that resistance is occurring. And I think we're not getting a reduction in disease to after many, many good you know rounds of, of use of this drug. So we're back to the basics. And this there is wonderful work by someone I would consider a mentor of mine, Joe Cook, um, who was the medical director of the McConnell Clark Foundation, then became, when the International Trachoma uh, Initiative was set up, he became the first director. But early in his career, he was at the Rockefeller Foundation, and he went down to St. Lucia, 
in the Caribbean, the island of St. Lucia, where they had schistosomiasis everywhere. Um, and they were using old schistosomiasis drugs because schistosomiasis involves a snail, uh, mm-hmm. intermediate host. Um, they tried in, in the, in the rivers using molluscicides, so pouring, you know, toxic material into waters to kill the snails. And they did, they compared, it wasn't randomized control. This was sort of experiential real world type of study, but, um, they've written beautifully about areas where they didn't just molluscicides. Areas where they kept the kids away from the, the water so that they, their poop wouldn't get into the water with the, with the eggs. Then, in fact, you know, create a mere city and it infects a snail and then comes back to in, infect the, you know, the, the next round of kids. Um, and then uh, various drugs that they were um, using. And so they've, they've written this up. Um, but I think we are back to, to integrated control. I think it's go- going to have to involve some degree of snail control some degree of uh, keeping uh, uh, those infected folks, you know, away from the water. And then, you know, in areas that are under conflict, um, where people's primary focus is on their next meal, mm-hmm. it's hard to organize those, those types of things. But the communities, I do believe, will figure this out in some way. If you're not just talking down to them from, you know, various NGOs or from Geneva or from, you know, Seattle, at the tropical medicine meetings, but actually working with the communities to figure this out, I think they'll do it. Right. I mean, I, the history of controlling uh, hookworm in the United States serves as a gold standard for organizing at every level, you know, education, urbanization, uh, architecture, <laughs> um, and fecal control, the control of feces is at the center for that. And a lot of people use feces as fertilizer. That's a huge problem because if you can't fertilize your crops, then they won't grow as well. And if they don't grow as well, then the nutrition of the whole community goes to hell in, in a handbag. And how do you get around the problem of having to use a natural product untreated mm for annual crop production when you've got diseases transmitted that way that they understand that, but they would say, uh, what choice do we have? We've got to eat. And so this is how we do it because, uh, I can tell you a program that was initiated through Columbia university's, uh, engineering department. They have a group called engineers without borders and they went to Ghana and, uh, in Ghana, they, uh, got a hold of a, uh, a community that wanted to, to sanitize. And so what they did was they built a series of composting toilets, mm. about 70 of them. And they they put the whole community on them. And uh, they came back the next year to find out how things were going. And they said, this is fantastic. This is the best thing that ever happened to us because now in order to collect the feces for our fertilizer, all we have to do is go to those 40 collection units, which you're going to call composting toilets, we're going to call those the source of our fertilizer. And they were right back to square run. I mean, it was just very frustrating to see how they understood what they were doing. They understood why they were doing it, but they couldn't stop using feces as fertilizer. So they gave up. They just threw their hands up. And went, now what are we going to do? And I, I think the solution, of course, uh, is multifaceted and it requires a lot of input and a lot of education. Uh, but it can be done. And in some places it has been done. Unfortunately, by the way, as highly studied as St. Lucia has been as a test case for what to do on an Island community where you should be able to control it. They still have schistosomiasis on that Island. And I'm absolutely stunned that, and not everybody in the world, in that island, you should get that on your dinner plate every morning or every evening, rather. There's a there's a prosequential pill. Take your prosequential. If everybody got treated, uh, you could eliminate the damn thing. But uh, that's, of course, not happening either. I don't know why, but that's... You know, I had another thought I just wanted to raise because, you know, our, our friend Daniel Griffin is in Uganda, I think, this week. And mm-hmm. he, he must have been thinking about malaria because he sent us the uh, <laughs> the 20... 20- 23 uh, malaria report and I, I i hadn't seen it before he sent it so I'm, you know daniel's great in forwarding stuff to us so, but i took a quick look at it um 
And it raises the issue of what happened during the pandemic to these programs. And there's been a, uh, a, right. an uptick in malaria, but and, and maybe sure. General will talk about that when he comes back. Um, but all of the mass drug administration programs and control programs and, and, and many of the, the vac- pediatric vaccine programs were impacted by the pandemic. Um, I have some great uh, photos from you know, friends of mine um, uh, from WHO who were in the region. Um, and one of the issues now, which maybe allows us to just reset, um, there have been um, many meetings held for the various disease elimination programs. And one that I was involved with was with obviously with trachoma about uh, what happened when we weren't doing the master drug administrations. Um, if you think about it, there, you couldn't get cargo. There were airplanes, you know, were grounded. Um, uh, people were not going out because of the obvious reasons with a uh, lethal virus cir- circulating. Um, and so, you know, how much um, to restart, for instance, in the mass drug administration with some intensification. And it wasn't sort of recommended. Workshops were held with people, again, from the regions involved the programs. Um, the, a rough, uh, algorithm designing when you might consider intensification. So by intensification, I mean, instead of waiting yearly to go back is why not give two doses this year? Um, uh, and, uh, some things that make sense for many vaccines, maybe it doesn't make sense for, um, but I think those are the types of discussions and then you have them in the broader context. Okay. Maybe we didn't take enough advantage of an educational program on what to do with poop, you know, and those types of things. And those latrines that, you know, maybe need to get fixed. Why don't we get some programming and some extra funding for, for that and, and to get them back on, on, on board. So there's a lot that can be done, I think, with this reset that is going on um, now that we have vaccines for the pandemic. I'm not sure we're post pandemic yet. I guess we, we sort of are, but, you know, we, we're seeing a lot of uh, COVID transmission. Still, uh, uh, too many we're, deaths. Frankly, um, we're just we're entering the endemic phase now. <laughs> yes, it's always going to be here. Chuck, so there's a table uh, in it. this in this roadmap. Um, mm-hmm. Current status of commitments to donations of medicine. So, I guess uh, there are different companies listed here. For example, Merck has pledge 250 million tablets a year of Praziquantel. Right. And so this is the German Merck actually that does that. That's yeah. the Merck GMB. So that, which are two different companies. And so they've been very generous actually. Yeah. So this is part of the program. This, this, I, I presume WHO negotiates with each company to do this. Is that correct as part of the program? No, 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 no. no. Um, so again, W, so there's WHO has been evolving so that, you know, um, uh, they really are most responsible for the normative guidelines. So what constitutes elimination? Okay. Um, and, and vaccines are done a little bit differently than uh, medicinal products. You know, v- vaccines go through a whole process of pre-qualification um, that then allows the funders. So without pre-qualification, you can't use the, the Gates money. You can't basically do programming for a vaccine. Mm-hmm. The therapeutics aren't covered in the, in, in the same way. They could, they could be, but they're, they're just not. Um, uh, WHO often will convene, you know, annual meetings, all the stakeholders involved. Um, and some of the, what you just referred to. So how many doses are needed? Mm-hmm. Um, the, a lot of the real work though gets done by the expert committees at say the task force for global health that will have an expert committee for the ivermectin program that they've been managing from day one uh they have that for uh trachoma elimination um merck the german merck will have that for the the through the schist of control initiative at imperial college will have that for their organization so i think a lot of the heavy duty science and whatnot and then it's rolled up, you know, to make sure that it, it, it fits the, the guideline recommendations that are that are coming out of WHO. Got it. And, and at the same time, who is any expertise needed? Do, do they have to provide, you know, physicians and physician assistants and so forth? Or is that all assumed to be available locally? 
Oh, right. So I think that there's, <clears throat> you know, uh, a lot of funding that comes from the non-governmental organizations yeah. on um, healthcare, uh, you know, pri- provider um, uh, education, but okay. ultimately the personnel, the responsibility for that is the Ministry of Health. Okay. And the Ministries of Health will uh, work on grants, um, also just with their own ministries of finance to do the budgeting for their own uh, elimination work. Um, and, you know, the, the advocacy usually comes from the N- NGOs to mm. outline and to work with the, with the donors for the, the medicines. And so, um, you know, the Trachoma Expert Committee for, uh, in, at the Task Force of Global Health will work directly with Pfizer on estimating uh, the, the supply of drug. And then when there's, you know, sort of, they call it uh, force majeure, right? So when there's acts of God or whatever, um, acts of nature, like a pandemic or a hurricane that maybe wipes out a, a manufacturing plant and there's a delay in the supply chain, which these things happen. I, you know, Puerto Rico is a major manufacturing um, for pharmaceutical products. And um, you know, that, that last hurricane, you know, shut down manufacturing for many, uh, uh medicinal products. And so, um, this, this all gets done more with, with the expert committees. WHO tends to have a representative sitting on those committees though, mm-hmm. um, either as a full member or as an ex officio, uh, member of those committees. And they're, they're essential to the, the discussions, obviously. Okay. So, uh- where where is trachoma a problem since you're familiar with that yeah so it's really you know despite the success and elimination now and i haven't i didn't get a chance to check the at, at www maybe dixon could do this while we're while I'm riffing on this one uh, www.trachoma.org i think we're up to about 16 17 or 18 countries that have been officially certified uh-huh. as eliminating trachoma by by who um, the one country that is really <laughs> still hyper endemic is Ethiopia. Okay. And it's, it's incredible because there's, there's been, just been wonderful work going on in Ethiopia with a very committed, you know, uh, president of the country minister ministry, you know, there was a, uh, hopefully, you know, I think things have settled down, but there was a little bit of a civil war going on in Ethiopia just before the pandemic. So, but prior to that, there had been parts of the of, uh, regions um, of, of the country that had received, you know, eight, nine, ten annual doses of azithromycin, <clears throat> and you know, while the overall level of disease has come down, it's still frighteningly hyperendemic. Um, the Carter Center does a lot of work in mm-hmm. Ethiopia uh, vis-a-vis trachoma, uh, and has done. Uh, some follow-up work looking at in also doing intensification with, with a group at UCSF uh, led by Tom Leitman, uh, who actually was in our class, Dixon. Uh, he's a PNS sure. graduate. Um, <clears throat> went in, he's an ophthalmologist now and is the head of the Proctor Foundation at UCSF. But he's done some remarkable work around in, uh, in his group, obviously, um, uh, working with Ethiopian colleagues around intensification. So one, two, three, or even four doses um, a year, uh, and doing that in a controlled fashion to see if it makes a difference. Um, so Ethiopia is the real outlier right now. Where yeah, so right, um, you asked me to look this up, so I did. So I'll just read you. It says globally, almost 1.9 million people have vision loss because of trachoma, and it causes 1.4 percent of all blindness worldwide. The two countries that are most common for this infection are indeed Ethiopia and South Sudan. And uh, it says that Australia is the only developed country that has trachoma. Mm. So uh, it's poverty related, it's lack of water related, right? And it's usually dry, uh, desert-like conditions that uh, allow this to transmit. And, And flies are important from person to person, I presume. Uh, although Chuck, you know more, much more about it than so, I do. So Australia <laughs> was was it was in, interesting. We, we when at the when Tacoma started twenty five years ago, we wanted to we needed to have this at the time. We thought we had to have a quote an indication. So we had a study, 
it was good evidence. We put a dossier together, but we wanted a regulatory authority to approve this so then we could then follow with the donation. Okay. <clears throat> there are different ways to, there are different mechanisms to do that these days, but back then that was the way it was done. We went to a couple of countries in Africa that had, you know, pretty well developed regulatory authorities and countries like South Africa said, we don't have trachoma. We don't want to review this. Hmm. Um, so we went to Australia and there was an eye surgeon in Melbourne who was a trachoma expert and he was the external expert reviewing the uh, uh, positioning the dossier with the regulators. And so the Australians were the first group to put it in a label, which then could be recognized by the first five countries which were, I think, Vietnam, the Gambia, um, Ghana, Mali, uh, Egypt, uh, to start doing mass drug administration. So it was interesting. There's a long history of Australia and, and trachoma. And uh, so a nice little uh, tidbit there that you found, Dixon. Well, it's <laughs> first page that came up. <laughs> <laughs> Pfizer has donated a lot of doses of azithromycin for trachoma. Yeah, um, you know, I think when you also when you go to the task force for Global Health website, I think Merck now with ivermectin is mm -hmm. almost close to four billion doses um, because they've been at it, you know, the longest. For I mean, that's the the longest uh, yeah. uh, disease elimination program. But when I was leaving Pfizer in February, um, actually, it was it coincided with the the billionth dose, and so. Um, you know, these are things, you know, it's interesting. I and mean, I think we talked a little bit about this 12 years ago. So why do companies do this? Right. Um, and, um, you know, our, 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 our CEO, who's a, uh, a veterinarian and a PhD, you know, kicked off the discussion and people from, especially people from manufacturing that have to do so much problem solving to, to work on the supply chain. Now, to celebrate the billionth dose, it, it just it's a moment to reflect on on the work. And, um, you know, people from the task force were there, WHO were there, some of the Carter Center people came just to, to share on that moment. But, uh, you know, I think the companies that do this, so the German Merck with Prazi Quantum, Merck obviously, and Roy Vagelis doing the, the first program with mm -hmm. uh, ivermectin. And, you know, river blindness is a really important disease. It's about one tenth the cause of blindness that trachoma is, so not quite as big a disease. But being you know there first, and and ivermectin is also used for lymphatic filariasis with two other drugs, with albendazole and DEC. Um, and albendazole is uh, a, a GlaxoSmithKline drug that they also donate into uh, the effort. It's a complicated thing. <laughs> complicated thing. incredible that's why we need this roadmap to sort everything out for us for, 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 at least let us. you know you're you're driving on the right road <laughs> well are yeah, you, and, uh, uh, chuck are you optimistic about this oh i think that you know we'll get to 2030 which is what this document covers right. and um it'd be nice if we meet all of the the targets right um I think we had hoped that when the last version came out for the 2020 targets and some we met and some we didn't, but I, I you know, you have to set goals. Um, you have to be aspirational when you set goals and not just have, you know, easy yeah. walk in the park goals. Mm -hmm. um, and then more importantly is you have to measure against these goals and, and make sure that the level of accountability is at the right yep. part of, you know, who's doing what um, and bring people together, talk about how we're doing and you know, continuous improvement and learning is, 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 so I, I am optimist, but I'm also an op optimist by nature. So, um, you couldn't be in the drug and vaccine discovery and development without having a certain amount of optimism because most of what we do fails, <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is Indeed. surprising. I think when I say that to some to people that are already in, yeah, that don't do this work, it's true. Dixon, any final thoughts? No, it's just that I would. I want to acknowledge the fact that Chuck and I have uh, shared a uh, a common past while I was at Columbia, and he was one of our um, most appreciated teachers for the course that we ran called Parasitic Diseases, and um, a lot of that <clears throat> shows in his compassion for people who can't help themselves. I mean, you you spent your whole time at Columbia as an AIDS infectious disease person, as I recall. Or TB, least, yeah. TB and TB also. 
We're in the clinic on 168th and Broadway. It's there, still there you go. And uh, <laughs> whoever's sick, come on in and we'll try to treat you. And, and that's yeah. the way it goes. And mm. your, your heart is in the same place as your head, which is a great place because they're both aimed at um, empowering people who can't help themselves. That's basically it. So we've been working hard on this. And I think that, you know, Parasites Without Borders is a, you know, as we kind of think about, well, we have to get the eighth edition done. Right. Yep. Oh, we will. Um, I'm trying to weave in some of the roadmap to, you know, some of the nematode chapters that you've taken a good first pass at. And now I got to add a, my little piece too. did some work on that today and I'll keep working on it. Dixon. Next week's going to be a busy week for that. We have to good. finish a lot of this before Daniel gets back from Uganda. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think also awesome. we should, we should think about what's, what's the next thing that we can do with parasites without borders when it comes to protozoan helminth diseases. I have some ideas. I know you, you're a fountain of ideas all the time and yeah, well, we'll, we'll get together with Vincent and Daniel and maybe we can even t- wrestle down Peter Hotez to join us for uh, a director's meeting and uh, we'll just, we'll just hash things out. Hmm. Good. All right. That is TWIP224. You can find the, the show notes, microbe.tv slash TWIP. We'll put a link to the uh, roadmap you want to send in any questions or comments, it's twip at microbe.tv. And if you like our work, what we do here at Microbe TV, we'd love your support. That's how we run everything here. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Our guest today, let's say from Parasites Without Borders, Chuck Kanersh. Welcome back. <laughs> Another twip is parasitic, or <laughs> we could say... TGIF, it's TWIP. <laughs> That's right. Dixon de Pommier is at trichinella.org and thelivingriver.org. Thank you, Dixon. Always a pleasure, as they would say. And I, I, uh, uh, I'm pleased to see you back as a guest. Maybe you should be a regular contributor. Yeah. How's that for a challenge? <laughs> I have some ideas. All right. I'm sure. I'm, we would love to hear them. I'm Have Vincent. a great weekend, gentlemen. Yeah. I'm uh, Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIP and Ronald Jenkins for the music. Okay, now, here's where you, you, you have your, your role here. Get Chuck. ready, Chuck. You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another TWIP is parasitic? <laughs>